morning. Good morning and welcome to the ThoughtWorks Quarterly Technology Briefing. My name is Ben Escudero. I'm a client principal for ThoughtWorks here in Sydney. And just as a housekeeping measure, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you could just put your phones to silent before we start, that'd be fantastic. Just, um, I just want, to know, want everyone to know that we've left evaluation forms on, our, on the chairs. Um, feedback's important to us at ThoughtWorks and we have an incentive for you to fill those out and I'll be covering that a little bit more later on. Um, in terms of today's presentation, um, when, we, when we were deciding on what topic to do for um, our, the, this quarterly technology briefing, we came across this one because it was something that we were seeing um, in our client base across the country. We're seeing the the economic situation and the turbulence that Europe is experiencing at the moment um, is filtering its, its way down into the IT departments um, across the country. On top of that, we've got that the, the technology, the, the, the innovation that's going on in the technology space, um, the revolutionization, the consumerization um, of IT is putting more and more pressure on IT departments who are being asked to do more with less with, greater, with a greater degree of organisational uncertainty. So coming up with today's um, briefing, we thought innovate, learn, deliver would be ideal. Um, what we're seeing is that most organisations, the old tricks in terms of delivering innovation, outsourcing, offshoring have been exhausted. And what we've got today to offer is a framework that we use with our clients to help them innovate. It's a simple, repeatable method that we hope that you'll get some value from. So without any further ado, I'll introduce our two presenters today. So Dr. Scott Shaw, who's um, Head of Technology for Asia Pacific, and Jason Fennell, who's a client principal in our experience design practice. Thank you. Morning, and thank you for getting up early. I know it's painful. Um, so yeah, Innovate, Learn, Deliver is the uh, topic for today, staying ahead in turbulent times. Um, it's, it's really our story about uh, how we've been exploring what continuous design and continuous delivery looks like. Um, and, uh, and it'll be a series of, of, well, at first a bit of theory, but then some case studies that really embody uh, our approach and, and how we think it's working. Um, but to start with, uh, everyone loves a uh, horror story. Um, so uh, Scott is going to stand up and attempt to scare the hell out of you. Yeah, so we're going to talk about turbulence, and, I'm, and we're going to, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but um, we, we want to motivate you a little bit, get you uncomfortable and, and frightened, and then we're going to talk to you about how you might deal with that. So um, we all, uh, I think, are aware that we're living in turbulent times. Uh, there have always been turbulent times, but it seems to be accelerating right, right now. Um, and that creates a lot of problems. It creates a lot of danger. And, but it also presents opportunities. The problem with turbulence is that we... Um, we have fixed mental maps, and we have mental maps that have served us well. And when, when we experience turbulence, those mental maps no longer serve us. And so what we need to do is find a way uh, to work without a map. We need to find a way to explore and, and ask questions and find our way through this, the, the market climate and economic times uh, that are changing rapidly in front of us. Um, this book, uh, by Upside of Turbulence by Donald Sull, that, that has a lot of good advice for dealing with this. Um, just as some further evidence for you, uh, this is an IBM report, a survey of 1,500 CEOs who found that, um, not surprisingly, the business climate and the economic uh, environments that they're operating in are more volatile, they're more uncertain, they're more complex, and they're structurally different uh, than they have been in, in the past. Um, the reasons for this are many. There are the, the, it's the interconnectedness that we're dealing with, the, the fact that we, that we are just as connected to people in China or Russia as we are to people in, uh, in Doncaster. And uh, it's the technology, it's the, it's the increasing pace of development of technology, and it's, it's the globalization too. It's the ability to be able to outsource, to get work done anywhere in the world, and the, the increasingly fluid flow of capital across national boundaries. So, you're pro you may be in one of these industries. We've seen business models overturned every day, and we've seen quite a few in recent years. This isn't a new thing, the turbulence 
this kind of turbulence, you know, goes back to what, like the steel industry and the and the automobile industry in the United States in the 1970s, and 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 these are organizations, these are businesses that were not able to shift their mental map, that were not able to work and adapt and find the opportunities in turbulence. Um, obviously, Kodak is the most recent one that we're all aware of that did fail to adapt to the the changes in digital photography. Um, of course, now the digital camera manufacturers are threatened by the, the advent of 8 megapixel, 16 megapixel smartphones. Um, print journalism, the newspapers are not what they used to be, and new newspapers that we used to see as rocks, and, and uh, the standbys that would always be there are going out of business daily. Uh, the music industry has already been through an enormous upheaval and completely changed who the dominant players were and what their distribution mechanisms are, and so on and so on. Movies are having to adapt to this. So, the chances are that if you don't see your vertical up here, um, it's going to be. The, uh, the evidence is that business model life cycles are last about seven years these days. So if, you're, if you have a comfortable business model, your business, it's working for you, you're profitable, um, the chances are seven years from now it's not going to be anymore. So everybody, and I, and I think it, it bears the, the response that we've got to this talk and, and to similar events that we've put on shows that people are acutely aware of this and looking for ways to deal with it. And of course the, um, the standard answer and the, what everybody knows um, that the way to deal with this is through innovation, that we need to constantly be innovating in order to deal with this turbulence. We need to be constantly making, taking, uh, asking questions and exploring the, the answers to those questions in our businesses. Um, of course, uh, that, that doesn't mean that we have, that we know how to do innovation. Uh, lots of times what, we, what comes to our mind when we think about innovation is the brilliant inventor working by himself that comes up with a flash of insight. But that's not a, really how innovation works, and I think we're all aware of that. that and what, we, what we'd like to talk to you about today is, is a framework for innovation. You know, what, what is it, what can you put in place to repeatedly be able to generate innovation in your business uh, and, so, um, the, there, and one way to look at this is that there are, there are, it, are really three levels of innovation, um, at least. But th these are the ones we want to talk about. So uh, we're all familiar with product innovation. We're also familiar with that, you know, the 3M sticky note and the, those, those ideas of the brilliant inventor. Uh, that's the first kind of innovation we think of. But we also have to talk about how we motivate and, and, and facilitate those people, those, the, the, the workers that come up with those innovative insights. So the, there's also a level of management innovation where we need to get away from the idea, the, the, the idea that Frederick Winslow Taylor had that the workers do and the managers manage and the managers do the thinking for the organization and the workers merely carry out the processes that the managers invent that, that, that are most efficient for them. And we're living in the knowledge age and we're living in an age of knowledge workers and we really need to, to give those people room managers we need to come up with a completely new leadership style for those uh, for those knowledge workers if we want to make innovation a repeatable process in our businesses and at the top of course is the business model innovation so this is the challenge that the Kodaks and the uh, the music industry and the movie industry are facing is what what is our new business model to cope with the, the changes um, that we're facing today. So uh, it's a bigger problem than just how do we come up with new brilliant ideas. Okay, so while thinking of innovation at those three levels is, is useful to get an idea of what the scope of it is, um, uh, what we need is one sort of unifying framework that helps us navigate, you know, changes across all of those. So someone has been thinking about this uh, in parallel with us, I'd like to say, uh, and that's uh, Eric Reese and his, his framework of build, measure, learn. Um, it's, it's incredibly simple and actually uh, applies to all three of those, of those levels. So um, frustratingly for, not, for us, he's not a thought worker, um, but, but he's generating a lot of excitement uh, inside our company and um, should be within yours. So his, his idea is, is the build, measure, learn loop. And from my point of view, as a, as a designer, design practitioner, it's kind of frustrating for this guy to get so much traction with this because this is what designers have been doing their whole life. Um, but what, he, what has changed here is that instead of a few uh, designers going to a lab and iterating around a prototype and then feeding that into the kind of standard uh, big upfront design process, uh, it's the total time through the loop that he's, he's brought to life, which is um, getting it out to real customers in a real market and learning from, from, from their real responses. Um, so yeah, total time through the loop. 
Um, his, his simple message, which I think is a good one, is you know, stop wasting people to, people's time. Um, you know, at best, your, your ideas are, are a hypothesis, so spend a large majority of your time testing those assumptions. Um, another person who's, who's been putting some thought into innovation is Don Norman, sort of one of the elder statesmen from, from my community. Uh, he's just put out a paper uh, on the difference between disruptive innovation and incremental innovation and in some ways has confirmed the suspicions of a lot of technologists that while designers talk a lot about innovation uh, and, and, and can be quite fluent about, you know, they've, they've got processes and, and ways of working that will achieve innovation, um, what they're actually very good at is incremental innovation, small changes to make a product better. Um, um, and uh, he, he came up with the idea that disruptive innovation is often, as people guess, you know, something that, that technologists might be doing in a, in a garage, uh, exploring without direction, um, and so it's, it's important to sort of keep those, those two things uh, in mind. So, um, yeah, I think, I think nerds are now way cool. Um, uh, they've, they've changed the way uh, that, that designers think about design, and um, if you look at these three guys from Revenge of the Nerds, they're actually quite cool now, uh, which is a bit strange. So yeah, nerds kind of have cool words. What I found coming to ThoughtWorks is that um, there are some very powerful uh, words that describe approaches that are affecting the design community, um, not just in ThoughtWorks, but in a wider view. So rapid, continuous, iterative, collaborative, emergent, you know, cycle time, quality. These are words that we're picking up and using um, and, and running with. And I think it's significant that Scott and I are on stage together. So uh, head of technology, designer telling their shared story about how to innovate um, and I think if nothing else that's that's one of the keys um, and, and we'll be we'll be exploring more of that so you know in the end a simple way of looking at this is that one of the keys to it to, to innovation is building balanced teams uh, building teams with, with the ability to uh, uh, measure and learn uh, and and drive business outcomes so balancing that set of skills with a, an engine of delivery and if you can find that balance then um, uh, you'll be you'll be in a better place. So that's the kind of setup uh, before we run into the case studies. But before we plough into those, uh, Scott's just going to speak a little bit about some of the technology enablers that we're, I think, positioning the standard now. <laughs> yeah, so if you're in a startup, um, you have no choice but to work in the way that Jason just described. So you probably only have um, a a handful of people in the business and everybody has to do everybody else's job. You know, designers, technologists, you're sitting in a little room or a garage together and of course you're working together very closely. Um, but for some reason when businesses get large, they kind of forget this. They forget those lessons and they forget how to do this. And, and what we see is that businesses who are facing the pressures that, that I talked about before and know that they need to invent themselves still go about it in the way that they go about all, uh, everything else. So they, they start really large projects. They plan the large projects and they plan them with fixed scope that's going to go over a long time. They, plan, they start planning for delivery a year from now. The, their new business idea that's going to compete with the fast movers in the market, right? They hire external design agencies to come in and, and, and they, uh, they produce a pile of wireframes. You may have some piles like this on your desk. Uh, that tell exactly what the system is going to do uh, once it's built and deployed to the market a year from now. Um, they, they make huge upfront infrastructure investments, right? They, because they need to plan very carefully their capacity and it needs to integrate with their existing enterprise architecture and they probably buy some ESBs and some data power machines and things along the way to, uh, because, you know, you, you have, those are the things that are going to enable the, the business to scale up. And, and then they don't do any, they, they release 18 months down the road. They've not, they have, uh, and don't do any user testing along the way. So those are kind of all the negative patterns that we'd like to talk to you about. And what, some of the things we're going to talk about um, today are indeed startups, but some of them are big enterprises. And, and we really believe and have shown that the same uh, approaches that work with startups the, the idea of using uh, appropriate technology, of, uh, of working closely together, small collaborative teams, designing and evolving the product o over time, starting with the minimal vi viable product, um, really applies to enterprises just as well as it, as it applies to startups. Um, and, and another thing you'll notice is that when I go through here, that I'm not going to give you, there are going to be, there are not going to be many technological revelations. 
a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is, is uh, the kinds of technology that we have found to work for, for uh, 10, 15 years now. And, and it's, uh, but people sometimes fail to realize these big businesses that need to reinvent themselves is that they, they say, oh, I want some of this continuous design. I want some of this continuous delivery. Uh, we have the, uh, can you come in and just and provide a design, uh, some design help for us? So can you come in and help us close the, the, the gap of the last mile to get our stuff into production? Well, uh, failing to realize that it's the foundations of technology. It's the foundations that, that we build up on that allow us to work in this kind of evolution. Way. So we're going to move on to some case studies. Uh, the first couple we're going to talk about come from social impact projects that ThoughtWorks is doing. These are really important to us. We, we try to uh, keep a, a number of these in our portfolio at any given time. Partially because um, they're, they're opportunity, they're things that we can talk about, they're things that we can bring to the market like this and talk about what we did and how we did it and share a story with our customer. Um, but it's also because this stuff's important to us, that we think that we should not be just building great software, but we should be leaving the world a better place than we found it. And we really all take that to heart. Um, th but then we're going to also talk about some enterprise a app uh, some examples, you know, places, uh, to some things, realestate.com, um, Suncorp, and... and, and uh, and then we're going to finish by talking about um, something that's really on the cutting edge and forward-looking that we can't talk too much about, but we'll tell you how, it's, how we're going about it. Big step. Um, OK, so the first case study, Live Below the Line. Uh, this is a service that essentially is about um, raising awareness about people in the world who are living below the line. Uh, and that means living on less than $2 a day. So uh, it was a site set up um, to uh, yeah, allow people to participate participate and for, for people to sponsor those who are participating. Um, the initial launch was done in about six weeks um, with a public campaign launch in about three months and that public campaign launch was across four different countries. Um, so it moved fast and it moved from you know initial idea to uh, uh, up and running fairly quickly. So in, in all of this it always starts for us with collaborative design workshops. So we bring the entire team together, business technology, uh, product, testing, anyone who, who is a stakeholder, bring them together and, and use sketching to uh, facilitate conversations and have concrete things to, to, to kind of talk about. Um, the, the designer is a facilitator in this role uh, and guides the entire team through, through that process. The outputs of those kinds of things are usually sketchboards. And you can see a sketchboard here. It has um, three different types of uh, roles down the left-hand side, participants, uh, donors, and, and the public. And it describes the journey that each of those would go on in the application um, and, and how they kind of interrelate. Um, and it's, it gives everyone a clear and shared understanding of what this thing needs to do. Um, it's easy then once you've got a fairly clear customer journey to be able to extract out um, uh, stories or, or bite-size uh, uh, little bits of, of work to do that uh, a development team can consume and, and organise themselves around. So those stories then get into the standard kind of um, uh, story wall. We, we set up what we're going to do across the iterations and kind of manage the work in progress together as a team. Um, in these examples, I think co-location is one of the key elements. So you can see that's the entire team sitting together. And uh, in the background, there are they are always connected with London, Melbourne, and somewhere else I can't remember. Um, and you can see there, it's kind of fun uh, having, sitting there with a Google Hangout space and sticking sticky notes on people um, when they can't see it. So um, yeah, the project sort of rolls along. And uh, we, we believe that uh, having information radiators or walls that generally tell everyone what is going on in the project helps a lot. You can see here, uh, this is a design wall. Uh, some areas like the home page are higher fidelity now. We're sort of moving along through the project. Uh, some are lower fidelity, so donate. Um, isn't quite there, it's still at the sketch stage. You can see that the design is evolving throughout the build. Um, it's, it's happened continuously. So uh, the little red uh, uh, pink stickers help us map functionality to the particular experience and, and help keep those two, the way you manage it and what you're creating in, in sync. Um, what we've discovered is that hiring men with long fingers and hairy arms is very important. Um, but the other, the other thing is that uh, getting uh, devs and designers to sit next to each other and, and, and thrash out ideas on the fly uh, works, works really well. Um, and you can see an example of that. Um, so, you know, we talked a bit about like management innovation. So having, having a means by which you can inject new learning and understanding of the customer into the project and then prioritise is important. So as we do user testing, we've got a way of, of understanding what needs to be fixed, putting that into the backlog, 
making priority calls and fixing it if required. So um, that's, that's one of those management innovation things. So that's, that's the first uh, case study of, of how we approached it in design. Now Scott's going to talk about some of the enablers that allow teams to actually act like that and move, and move that quickly. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of intersperse some discussion of technology enablers uh, through, throughout here um, because it's this underlying foundation of te technolo technological quality, te of software quality and, and practice that, we, that make this all possible. Um, I, these, there was, as we went through these case studies, we found that there was some remarkable consistency, actually, about how people were going about the, these things. So um, uh, I'll, I'll choose different uh, opportunities to talk about the, some of these things, but each of these things I'm going to talk about probably apply across the board. Um, the first thing is continuous delivery. This is something you've probably heard ThoughtWorks talk about before. But if you want to be able to, um, one of the, the key factors is getting rapid feedback here. So we want to evolve the design over time. We need to be able to get the, uh, to get the software into a production environment that, that uh, we can expose to as many people as possible and start getting feedback as early as possible on these, things, on these minimum viable products. Right? Um, so when we talk about continuous delivery, we're really talking about keeping the software in a state that where it's possible to deploy it into production at any time, um, at, any, at, at any moment, at any day. And put the, the, the decision for putting that software in production and releasing it to the market into the hands of the business. It's no longer a technical bottleneck to get that stuff into production. So you do this through relentless automation. Right? We, uh, uh, and on Live Below the Line, it's really, it's kind of anticlimactic. If you say, well, let's release into production. Um, you know, it's one command at the terminal. There's a little bit of, you know, there's no dramatic uh, bells that go off or anything. And they do this many times, uh, many times uh, a day, actually and release it, releasing directly into a production environment. Um, over a two-month period, they did about 25 production releases while this was under development. Um, it, uh, and it takes about 90 seconds to do that. But this wouldn't be important, this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the availability of the cloud. So cloud something that gets a lot of discussion in, I, in the IT industry today. Um, with enterprises, within enterprises, we hear a lot about the cloud as a way to get the maximum efficiency out of hardware. Uh, it's a way to, uh, to control costs, operation, operating costs with, within, our, um, within our hosting environments. And I think what gets overlooked in those discussions is the biggest impact that the cloud, things like Amazon Web Services or Heroku as a, as a, as a platform, it's a service that allows you to deploy complete applications. Um, the, the, the real impact that these services have had on the industry is in fostering innovation. I look at the cloud um, as being very similar to hardware as open source was to software about 10 years ago. What you see is a, is a real democratizing effect. So it's possible for one or two people to have an idea and to test that idea out in the marketplace. And then, if it's successful, to have that idea scale up to, to, to a large market uh, um, without really changing anything. It's possible, and, and I think a number of enterprises in Australia need to open themselves up to the fact that it's possible that in development environments, in testing environments, it's possible to take advantage of the cloud so that you can test in a, an identical environment to the one that you're going to deploy to in production. And, and of course, doing this all through auto automation and automatic, uh, automated provisioning of the machines and everything so that a development team can, with one uh, command, spin up an entire production environment uh, and then destroy it again just as easily. And that, this, is, this is, to me, the revolutionary idea behind the cloud. And, and it's something that every one of these projects that we're talking about would not have been possible if we didn't have that. The other thing um, is uh, working in vertical slices, right? So people wonder, how can you possibly evolve a design while you're developing? Don't you have to have the design all worked out? Don't you have to have the layout so that you can par parcel the work out to, um, to multiple people working on the team and, and doing development? So this is a, not a minimum viable product, right? This is a vertical slice that would not fly on its own. So what we, talk, what we want to, the, or, or float on its own. What, what we want to talk about is, is building vertical slices that, that in and of themselves have value and can be deployed to the marketplace. And if we take a look at the history of deployment of Live Below the Line, 
on. This was some very early deployments that went into production. So this is the profile page on Live Below the Line. Uh, there isn't much there. It's like I can sign up, I can put my picture up there, I can update my profile picture um, and say I'm doing this and why I'm doing this, but it, there isn't a lot of other um, activities and experience that the user can get out of the website. But over time, if we look at uh, now just a, uh, a week or so later, the, here now is a similar deployment. And, what, and uh, you can see that there's, now the, the user has the ability to create a team and to, to, to create a goal, okay? There's a couple of things that have been added here. The key thing to recognize here is that when you see a button like this on the screen, that's not just a button on the screen, that's a complete vertical implementation of that functionality. So the business logic necessary to create a team and link people together and the persistence necessary to be able to store that team in the back end, this is something you can release into production um, and has value immediately. It's not everything you want it to be, right? But it gets it out there and starts getting user feedback. And you'll see, um, we, if, we, if we watched a movie of this over time, you'd see how small things about the design and the experience changed over time because it was getting out there and being used. Um, and I see now, we, now the next one we have a, a ability to take donations. So that's not just, that's a feature, that's an entire feature. It's not just a button on the screen. That feature is complete and, and can be with one command released to the marketplace. And now, and now we can give people the opportunity to join a team so we, they can look at other teams and join teams. So at, we build up this functionality in vertical slices, and that's really an important concept to being able to evolve these designs over time. OK, so uh, again, another uh, social impact project, Control Shift. Um, essentially, uh, an attempt to empower ordinary people to become successful campaigners. Um, so Martin Luther King is the embodiment of, of a brilliant campaigner. We, we wonder what he could have done with, with our tool set. Um, so again, in the beginning, we, we bring the team together, we run collaborative design workshops, and something that's very important to us, I think, is defining the customer journey. So this is us beginning to talk about the journey that uh, campaigners will go on, another iteration of that, beginning to uh, describe what, what, what came to be known as the uh, engagement ladder. Um, and this is the sort of last iteration of that in the, in the sketch workshops, uh, the engagement ladder from awareness to becoming an organiser. And basically that this, that this thing is going to have to guide people on that journey and get them up that ladder. Um, it kind of looks the same, but I think, I think it's worth noting that this is a different set of people, uh, different design facilitator, but the same kind of process. Um, sitting down, sketching, having real assets, putting them on the wall and having real conversations about how it might be. Um, and fairly quickly those rough things turn into uh, uh, sketches that start looking like pages that then get put into a rapid prototyping tool um, uh, and then I think it is within two weeks um, they got to here which is um, working in the medium so this is a coded up uh, form um, that they're, they're starting to use to explore uh, the functionality so uh, with control shift um, that that's kind of what uh, it looked like in the end, and this is a, a, a white label site that, that they took out and started testing with people. Again, the kind of surgical lightweight tools that Scott's going to talk about soon. Um, design is sort of coming up with the same set of tools that, that do that kind of thing. So no longer is the ambition to build a, uh, a lab with a two-way mirror and a few hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. The ambition now is to get a copy of Silverback on your laptop and go and do it in a room anywhere as quickly as you can. So uh, this is a screenshot from Silverback with um, the, the audio being recorded. So it was a, it was a platform. Um, the first client of that platform we were very excited about uh, was GetUp, a, a, a company that we've, we've been doing a lot of work with. And um, they uh, ended up launching a Community Run, which is where they uh, allow people to create their campaigns on, on that site. Um, one of the most successful campaigns was one uh, uh, against Bob Catter. Um, and I think, I think what's important here to note is that um, this, the person who started this campaign was not a seasoned political player. Uh, they were just someone from the public who was annoyed and began a campaign about this ad. Uh, it gathered momentum through this platform and then got picked up by the media. And suddenly this woman found herself talking to, to the television cameras. Um, that's an exciting st story of empowerment. Um, so uh, again, yeah, we moved fast uh, and uh, uh, it happened collaboratively. And now Scott will talk about some of the technology enablers. 
Yeah, so uh, both of the examples that we just showed you were written in the Ruby programming language. Sorry for getting a, a bit technical for a sec. They were written in the Ruby programming language using the Rails web application framework, which is very commonplace now. Uh, so I, I can't help remembering that I stood in this very spot, in this very room about four years ago, talking about the use of uh, dynamic programming languages and, and Ruby in, and Rails in particular. At that time, the idea that we, you would use Ruby on Rails in an enterprise environment was, was really radical. I mean, that we, we weren't, we'd done it maybe uh, in one place in the world, but we saw that there was potential there. Um, Fast forward to today, it's really commonplace for us to write. We don't even talk about it anymore. It's such a big part of, of ThoughtWorks business and, and many other people's business to use tools like Ruby and Rails in an enterprise environment. We can build very quickly and re release them into existing um, J J Java, uh, JVM kind of environments. So um, that, th this is no longer a controversial s subject. You know, these tools have proven time and time again that they have viability in the enterprise. Um, and now we're kind of moving on to, to even small, smaller, more purposeful frameworks, things like Sinatra or Node.js, give us uh, the ability to work even, even more quickly. Um, so the, the selling point of that four years ago was really developer productivity. And it's true that these tools do make developers much more productive, you know, something like a half Maybe, maybe half the time to, to, to build something, the, the kind of applications that they're well suited for over, say, a Java, uh, a Java framework. Um, but what we didn't see is that the, that the ever-increasing accelerating, so much community contribution to, the, to these tools and the accelerating uh, pace of ease of use and, and purposefulness to these tool sets means that developers can now work in these tools and create web applications just as fast or faster as a designer can work in a prototyping tool. So this gives us the ability, now we have the ability to, to dispense with the prototyping phase. And, and we, do, we can do what, what Jason calls designing in the medium. So we're no longer designing in a prototyping tool and then throwing that over the fence to the developers. It's designers and developers sitting down, working in a very, uh, in, in a very surgical tool set like this to build the application, to build the minimum pieces of the application, build them up from smaller components, rather than starting with a giant framework and taking the pieces that you need. And, and, and for God's sake, if you, you, know, if you, if you need to want to get a minimum viable product out there, build, use a tool like this from, that allows you to build the software in a quality way and build only the pieces that you need. If you're, if you're dragging along a framework that does more than you need, that's all technical debt, and I promise you it will slow you down as you try to go forward. Um, this is about testing, which you can't go to a ThoughtWorks talk without talking about testing. Thank you, Fabio. I, it's, it's, the, the, the guy who made this uh, picture is actually in the audience, so um, I don't think he knew it was, I was going to show it. But th this is, so we, we talk a, a lot now about the healthy test pyramid. So with the, with the advent of um, the ability to write automated tests at the user interface, people kind of got it, it, a bit over exuberant about that. Uh, things, tools like um, Selenium, and to a certain extent like Quick Test Pro, you know, the, the, that give us the ability to test the UI, to automate tests at the UI. Um, people kind of focused on that and forgot about the underlying layers. And the, the penalty we pay for doing that, for exploding the number of tests that we run at the user interface, is that it's way too slow. It's way too slow to run, to, to, uh, to be able to test and release many times a day the way that, that we're advocating. So instead, we talk about this, this thing we call the, the healthy test pyramid. It's like the healthy food pyramid. You know, you eat a lot of grains and vegetables. And then, you, and, and then at the very top, you have some dessert and some, some protein you know, to, to, to cap it all off. In the same way, if you're not going to be successful with this approach unless you build up a healthy suite of unit tests. This shows this from an actual project. Uh, it happened to be a Java project, but it shows that we have you know many orders of magnitude more unit tests at the job. These are technical tests that run automated many many times a day uh, on the developer's machine. In the middle, we have some integration tests. We also test the JavaScript. It's really important um, as we uh, do more and more applications. Uh, like this, the JavaScript becomes much more important. We need to treat the JavaScript as a first class language and we need to write tests at the JavaScript level as well. So there's some JavaScript tests in the middle and then there's some integration tests. But these integration tests still run at the technical level. They're, st they're not running at the user interface. They're testing business 
concepts. They're testing acceptance, but they run very quickly in a, in a headless, UI-less way. And then at the very top, at the very top of the pyramid, our, our protein and our fat is, is the user interface test. And in this case, you can see there's, there's you know, thousands fewer UI tests, but it still takes 13 minutes to run. So we pay a heavy penalty for, we pay a heavy price for having those UI tests. They're very valuable. We need to be able to run them, but we need to be very careful in, when we're writing them and write just the ones that we actually need. 